There really isn't a moment in these games where I'd say Pokemon Scarlet and Violet run well. Ho oh ho, boy! Pokemon Scarlet are out. They're released. Oh, at least they are in most areas. It's time to check out the reviews because the reviews always have some spicy takes in them. And we're going to see some spicy takes today. We're going to react to a lot of video reviews. The first review we have is from GameSpot. Let's see what they thought, shall we? Scarlet and Violet make some subtle efforts to guide you to specific locations, but ultimately how you forge your own path through the vibrant new region of Paldea is what makes it so memorable. Scarlet and Violet starts off like most mainline Pokemon games. You Can I just say? If you have a starter that did not trend on Twitter, then that is embarrassing for you. Straight up embarrassing. Imagine using a starter that did not trend on Twitter. Oh my God, I could, I could, I could never. That's, that's hilarious. Imagine that. Wake up at home, meet your rival, pick one of three starters, and before long, you're exploring the world and catching a wide range of monsters. Revive. While the tutorial <laughs> might still feel a bit he just hit that scarabug in the face. That's so mean. Overbearing for longtime fans, it moves. Oh, like it is for every single tutorial and every single Pokemon game. Yes, we know. There's always the. Whenever you buy a new Pokemon game, you have to sit down for five to seven hours and do some studying. Literally this time, because you're going to school. A brisk pace. Before long, Nimona, your peppy, battle hungry rival, turns you loose, and you're free to explore a hefty chunk of the map battle trainers at your discretion, and catch wild Pokemon. It does slow down a bit as it introduces characters and the three main quest lines, but soon after- It also slows down because it's very technically not great. <laughs> free to explore Paldea in its entirety. Scarlet and Violet's strength lies in their freedom, and that freedom extends beyond its open world. At the outset, you are given three different paths to follow. The Path Whoa! of Legends, which has you hunt down and sick. defeat abnormally large Pokemon, Operation Starfall, where you deal with this generation's Team Rocket, and the familiar Victory Road, in which you take on eight gym leaders. Unlike previous games, there is no predetermined path through the story. Although trainers in wild Pokemon get tougher the further you get from Mesa Goza, Paldea's centermost city, there's- I actually don't know if I agree with the take that there's no preset path because you are kind of railroaded a certain way because the levels don't scale. There's no level scale in the game. So a, a strong gym leader is always going to be strong, like too strong for you to beat. But in like a small area, you can kind of take on things in whatever order you want. So it's it's much more free form, but it's it's a little railroady because you kind of have to go in a certain order. Outright stopping you from marching up to one of the toughest gym leaders in the game and challenging them to a battle. Yeah, but you're going to lose though. <laughs> Pokemon Scarlet and Violet doesn't even tell you how tough a specific area is until you're actually there. That is the scariest part about doing a Nuzlocke on this game. I I was doing a Nuzlocke on this, right? I, I, you can see it, it's on my channel right now. I, I started a Nuzlocke on this game. I didn't know where to go. I could anywhere you walk into can potentially just execute you immediately, like decapitate you on the spot. I was so scared going into any new area. I like look at the wild Pokemon and be like, um, should, I don't know if I should. Is this, is this strong? Is that strong? I don't know if it's strong. It kind of looks a little strong. Maybe, maybe I should go. I'm, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come back later. All right, I'm gonna come back later. That lack of transparency may seem odd in a level-based RPG, but it encouraged me to travel off the beaten path and scout out areas a traditional Pokemon game would have gated off. The la I will say it is fun doing that because you're just like, oh, there's a sense of anxiety and excitement every time you start battling. You're like, oh, am I going to die today? Is this death Active day? Random encounters also fosters this type of exploration. Pokemon are crawling over every square inch of the map. Palmy, the adorable new electric type rodent, travels in packs. Psyducks will saunter through fields, occasionally taking a dip in a nearby stream. And Pichus can often be found napping under shady trees. Like Wait, Pichu's Arceus, in this game? I often found myself chasing new Pokemon I spotted off in the distance until I ended up in an area I wasn't quite ready for. Occasionally, these spontaneous adventures- <sighs> Damn, look at that boy! Up, but sometimes I'd I walk looks away cool. with a powerful new Pokemon to join my roster. In many ways, it feels like Game Freak has finally taken the training wheels off of Pokemon. Throughout my I didn't adventure, get it because he did say training wheels when he had it. He was on his bike I thing, so like that's pretty I cool. I was constantly punching above my weight against gym leaders, 
Titan Pokemon, and Team Star bosses. In most cases, my Pokemon were lower levels than the competition, which Ooh, forced slapped. me to think beyond the familiar rock, paper, scissors type matchups. Nature's abilities and held items, things I rarely consider during a Pokemon game's main story, would often give me enough of an edge to nearly beat a trainer I would have otherwise lost. And that's actually a good point because there are a lot of shops where you can just go and get proper good items. Like pretty early on. You can just walk into a ton of shops and get like expert belts and charcoals and good items that buff up your mons and you're like, oh, I actually have to strategize a bit. What? A Pokemon game that I have to think in? What the hell? That's weird. Terastalizing adds another wrinkle to the challenge. Most key trainers you go toe to toe with will terastalize their final Pokemon, which can alter a Pokemon's typing. Every Pokemon- Terastalizing is scary too. I didn't realize terastalizing removes your secondary typing until like way later in the game. I was mind boggled. <laughs> and you can actually use that to like a strategic advantage as well, because if you're weak to something because of your secondary typing, you can terastalize and then get rid of that weakness and then get like super duper stab while also not being as weak anymore. It's cool. Region has a Terra type along with its standard type or types. However, some Pokemon you come across will have a Terra type different from their standard type. For example, the grass type gym leader Brassius uses the rock type Pokemon Pseudowoodoo, but his Pseudowoodoo has the grass Terra type. Once this Pseudowoodoo- I think it's a cool touch. The water or grass type attacks you usually use against a Pseudowoodoo won't be very effective. Most gym leaders use terastalizing to cover their weaknesses, making the final push a tad more difficult if you aren't prepared or underleveled. Of course, you don't have to play Scarlet and Violet the same way I did. You can seek out challenges you are appropriately leveled for and stick to safer areas while you train. This approach is still far more compelling. <laughs> what is that selfie pic? <laughs> traditional Pokemon structure because there are plenty of areas to explore. I love how you can take pictures. Like I, I will say the game is kind of ugly, but if you go like right up close to the camera, you can get some really nice snappy snappies a wide with Pokemon. Of Pokemon to catch and a handful of main objectives to complete wherever you choose to go. And even when I was under leveled for some of the tougher points of interest, I rarely felt like my only option was to grind out levels by repeatedly battling wild Pokemon. Grinding is far less tedious than it used to be thanks to the let's go mechanic. The let's go mechanic is so funny. You just send out Pokemon and it goes and it battles Pokemon, right? But you can send out Pokemon into like a group of other Pokemon and it will systematically one by one slaughter every member of that family. And it's so funny to watch because the last one will run away from you and it will cry. And that's a this little sad. This allows the first Pokemon in your party to auto battle wild Pokemon. Auto battling doesn't net you as much experience as a standard battle, but because auto battles are decided within a few seconds, you can battle a high volume of Pokemon in a short amount of time. Auto battling also ties into TM crafting. Unlike in previous games, once you find or receive a TM, you can craft copies of it at Pokemon centers. I think this is dumb. I, I don't know why they didn't just keep the, you keep a TM for other thing, because that was a massive quality of life improvement and then they just re reverses it, which is when stupid to me. When you wild Pokemon, it drops crafting materials and you can earn those crafting materials far more efficiently by auto -back. It seems like creating a problem that is then solved by grinding and getting materials from Pokemon, but that problem never existed in the first place and they felt a need to create an issue that materials would solve. But instead of creating like a different issue, they went back and reverted a really good choice that they made before in order to make materials useful, which they wouldn't have been otherwise because they couldn't think of anything else to do with it. Battle. However, while auto battles make TM crafting much easier than it would be otherwise, I'd much prefer an option to buy the ones I want. All TMs require components from specific- Pokemon, I don't know why they added crafting. You have to make an effort to track down that Pokemon and battle it a few times. The good news is that you can swap out your Pokemon's moves at any time. If you accidentally replace the move, you can go into the Pokemon summary menu and relearn it. This is also yes. true for TMs. If you use a TM on a Pokemon, that move will always be available in its move pool. That's it's good. It's a small change, That's a good point. a welcome one that makes it much easier to experiment with move sets on the fly. It's hard to discuss the competitive scene without touching on battle. Terastalizing will certainly shake things up, but it's difficult to say exactly how at this stage. 
We need Wolfie Glick to chime in on this one. Wolfie! Seriously, terastalizing is gonna be insane because you can get a terastalize of like any type, I think. I'm pretty sure. So you could make a God of War terastalize into like, what, a fire type? Can you imagine how complex that's gonna make fighting, fighting and battling? Now, if only they removed the 20 minute battle timer for singles, which they still haven't done, which is stupid and silly, In theory, but they need to do that. The team could cover far more weaknesses thanks to this mechanic. With six Pokemon to a team and potentially three different types per Pokemon, each Pokemon standard two types and a third different Terra type, you could represent all 18 types in one party. My hope is it will result in a far more diverse lineup of viable competitive Pokemon and new inventive strategies. Oh, absolutely. If you can turn anything into any type, then that makes so many more Pokemon so many more viable. Imagine a Bomber Snow that you can terrestrialize into just like a Fire type or a Water type. Make it actually viably useful Since instead of being dog war. such an important part of the team building process. As excited as I am to test out these strategies, Scarlet and Violet lack a battle tower. There are some exciting post-game challenges, but the absence of a proper battle tower makes it very difficult to experiment with different teams and test out new strategies in a low-stakes competitive environment. The omission of the battle tower is likely due to Scarlet and Violet's expanded suite of online features. I've never understood why people like the bio to battle tower so much, considering it cheats 90% of the time. And it's like a kind of fake challenge because it's not really fair in the way that it sets itself up. I was never a fan of the battle tower in any of the games because I was like, this is just a really boring slog and a grind. There are a ton of battles that just want to take my head off and use my eyeballs as soup. Unfortunately, as of now, the servers aren't live yet, so I haven't been able to test online battles, cooperative play, link trades, and surprise trades. Oh That's so weird that they wouldn't turn on those online servers for the reviewers to actually review it. So they can do multiplayer? Like, is Nintendo the only company that does that? Oh, what's going on? I am most curious to see what co-op adds to the package. Could you potentially play through the entire game with a few friends, or is it limited to basic exploration? If co That's what I want to know! Like, what if you do a cutscene while someone else is in the game? What if someone comes in, and you, I guess you can steal each other's Pokemon, but uh, how's, how's it work? We don't really know. As the single player, it could be a fantastic way to play these games. The level of freedom found in Scarlet and Violet comes at a significant cost, though, particularly in their presentation. These games look rough. There's a moment <laughs> early on where you follow your rival to Ah, oh, she said, she says beautiful nature stuff as far as the eye can see. And the game Talk shows the you happens. this. <laughs> For those of you wondering, yeah, YouTube does compress videos and make it look worse, but it doesn't look that much better in game. <laughs> Whether intentional or- Look at the beautiful nature as far as the eye can see. Look, there's so many- Polygons over well, there! It feels like it's supposed to be that moment in every open world game where you can appreciate the vast expanse of the world before you. Unfortunately, the muddy visuals undercut the moment. Mesa Goza looks like a collection of off-white shapes in the distance. The trees look more like green blobs than trees, and the road- Hey! You can't say anything bad about trees, okay? We're not allowed to say it. The meme is dead, alright? No more meme! Above the Pokemon Center Zip it. moves at only a few frames per second. While the Pokemon and key characters are well- Still better than NYC. <laughs> Leave New York alone! Textures are missing, objects in the distance are pixelated and jittery, Pokemon and NPCs are constantly popping in and out due to poor draw distances, and battles on uneven terrain will frequently cause the camera to clip through the ground. Between That's just showing you the amazing underworld of Paldea. You can see the underground as well. And doesn't it look so cool? Like Chronicles 3 and Bayonetta 3, the Switch has really shown its age this year, but Pokemon Scarlet and Violet feel as though they are being crushed by the hardware. Pokemon Legends Arceus had its fair share of visual shortcomings, but not to this extent. Whether you play handheld or docked, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are difficult on the eyes. I will say, I have heard it actually runs way better on handheld which is really weird, but they reduced the resolution on handheld obviously to 720p, and apparently the run the frame rate is a lot better. Fortunately, Scarlet and Violet run pretty well. Still whining about trees, are we? See, like, that's why you say you, you're not, you, you're never allowed to complain about graphics. Pokemon graphics are perfect. They're, they're, they're perfect. You can't say anything about them. Per second, but during my the tree meme has killed 
any kind of genuine discussion you can have around these games being like running like dog shit and looking like a muddy painting. With the games, I haven't experienced any slowdowns or significant dips to the frame rate. Of course- What? That's insane. Lucky boy. A game like Pokemon doesn't demand rock solid performance, but it is comforting to see that despite all of the visual rough patches, performance holds up decent. While undercooked presentation and visuals hold the game back, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are still the best mainline Pokemon games in years. They Ooh. build off Pokemon Ooh, Legends okay. Arceus's open-ended design in some thoughtful and surprising ways and retain that same level of depth that the mainline series is known for. Okay. That a solid 8 out of 10 from GameSpot. And so they that was interesting. They said they had like decent performance, whereas... Uh, my personal experience and the experience of a lot of other people was not that. So I get, they either got really lucky or I got unlucky. But let's see what... This is Nintendo Life, okay? This is uh, an organization built around Nintendo games. So you'd expect them to be a little bit nicer uh, towards Scarlet and Violet, potentially. Maybe uh, kind of downplay some of the not-so-good parts. But we'll see what they end up saying. I am going to play this at 1.25 times speed because it is a little bit of a long one. So let's just go. One thing we always hope for with a brand new Pokemon generation it's a sense of childlike wonder. wonder. Of course, it's not always a guarantee, especially with a formula that has been followed consistently for the last 26 years, but we always start a new generation with our fingers crossed that we'll be charmed out of the gate by the new creatures to collect and a whole new region to explore. And if I'm sorry, I love this guy's voice. This guy's voice is awesome. Has come close to recapturing that magic we felt when we it's discovered so soothing. our first Pokemon world in red and blue. It's Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's vast and open Paldea region. It's been a while since we felt like a kid stepping out of our Pokemon house and just looking at the world and savoring the taste of adventure. Despite some pretty significant technical stumbles, this introduction to Generation 9 nails that. Even if it's not the new Pokemon revolution, that legend- God, the mom in this game. The mom in this game. Oh my god. I have never considered myself a person that- it is an enjoyer of elderly women, but like, I mean, she's not elderly. I mean, o older women. As Arceus felt like, Scarlet and Violet's promise of being the main series' first open world game isn't a false one. Every inch of Paldea is ours for the taking, and we're ready for adventure just like the little kids who booted up their Game Boys for the first time and took their first steps in Kando. Adventure awaits, and it's right on our doorstep. Okay, Violet players are the lucky ones. Having a cyberpunk super... Like a super modern motorcycle that you can vroom vroom around on. That looks so much better than uh, climbing on top of a lizard. Except things don't start that way. You're a kid who's just moved to the Paldea region. Does that sound familiar? But instead of setting off on a brand new Pokemon journey, you leave home with your new neighbor and friend Nimona to join either the Naranja or Uber Academy. And I've probably mispronounced that. But regardless of pronunciation... <laughs> the caption said the Uber Academy. Who wants to learn how to do drop-offs? Who wants to do some ride chairs, baby? Any Uber Xs? And you're blacks around here. <laughs> Who wants some money? Schools in the Paldea region, and they're tied to your version. On the way to the academy, you bump into a mysterious and powerful Pokemon, Coridon or Maridon, depending on your version, who protects and accompanies you. And after meeting the teachers and I love these things so much. I love Coridon and Maraldon, Maralobodon so much. A treasure hunt, as they call it, to find your own personal treasure out there in Paldea. It takes a while to get to this so-called treasure. Scarlet and Violet's opening hours drag, leading up to the big moment of freedom. This feels that is the same with every Pokemon game. I don't know how they haven't managed to figure this out. That that pacing is so bad at the start of the game. They always do this thing every single time, where it takes like two hours for the game to be like, okay, you can play now. Come on, Game Freak, you need to sort it out. A little bit of pacing issues, Particularly yeah? bizarre after Sword and Shield managed to at least somewhat streamline the tutorials a bit, and with limited traversal abilities at the start, we had to really push through to make it through to the Academy. But it's worth it for just how much the world opens up to you. Your only goals are to complete three main objectives, beat all of the gyms, find the Mystica Herbs, and take down Team Star. The location of all these are marked on your map, and you can do them in whatever order you want. That's right, no more structured approach. If you want to go to the most northerly region first, then j just do it. The only thing you need to do is beat the three main paths to unlock one final part of the game. One of the most surprising aspects of Scarlet and Violet is the stories. Each of the three paths has its own narrative that ties either into the characters, the academy, or Paldea itself, and all knit together into a wholesome package. There are some- Something I was really surprised of. I actually like the characters. For once, they did it. They did it. They made characters that I don't immediately hate. Thank you. Lily did not like Lily. Hop, I, I Hop's okay. How did not like how. Marnie, she was all right. But Bede did not like Bede, but in this game, there are characters that are actually likable, and they are fun to interact with, and they are cool, and they all have good development. Congratulations, Game Freak. 
You figured out how to write characters. I'm very proud of you. Genuinely tender moments, and many of the characters have personalities that are conveyed well, both through the cutscenes and story moments. Your rivals and other NPCs are more involved than ever, and this is also a Pokemon game that isn't afraid to surprise you. Don't get us wrong, there's certainly nothing spectacular, and it's still more than weird that there's no voice acting that we want- That is- Actually a bigger drawback than I expected it to be. The no voice acting, you can really feel it at some parts. And it is, oh my, it could have been so much better. I want to say, right now, if there was voice acting, like good voice acting, they did it well, and the technical issues were non-existent, like it was really technically good and like it looks good, it was streamlined, like it ran really well. This could be like, not only like the best Pokemon game, but like maybe just the strip game of the year. Like it would have been so good. Box art stars, Coridon and Maridon. They have moments of vulnerability and, if you can believe it, adorableness as they look worried or even nuzzle up to other characters. They're frankly some of the best legendaries in the series ever. Of the three True. Are, Facts. Absolutely agree. Coridon and Maridon. Amazing. The road will be the most familiar to veteran Pokemon trainers. Collecting eight gym badges is pretty much the Pokemon rite of passage, and it's mostly the same here. Except instead of making your way through a gym puzzle, why does the Sunflora have a weird frame rate? Is that on purpose? You participate in a gym trial before you can take on the leader. These can oh, range from rolling an oversized olive around a maze to take- Like, the, the character is fine, but like, the Sunflora's are- stream and battling Pokemon oh. trainers, and it helps to change up the formula a tiny bit, and we found most of them pretty fun. You can also do the gyms in whichever order that you want, which in some ways means that the game's difficulty is at least a little bit in your hands. If you want your first gym leader to be the one with level 30 Pokemon, then you can absolutely do that, but with the caveat that you'll have to eventually deal with that level 15 gym, and it'll be even more of a piece of cake. In a game where the recommended order isn't much of a challenge, it was a nice surprise when we stumbled into a higher level gym and actually had to put up a bit of a fight in order to secure victory. The gym fights themselves may lack the stadium level spectacle of Sword and Shield, but it makes sense given the variety of tasks you're taking on. The other two routes offer a little bit more in terms of variety compared to your standard Pokemon gameplay. Path of Legends sees you take on Titan Pokemon to find the Herba Mystica. Of the three paths, this was the most disappointing to us and is- Really? I, I don't know. I, I think I disagree with that. I actually like this path a lot. I think it's good. Uh, I, I wonder why. From Legends Arceus' Alpha Pokemon battles. All you have to do- Okay, it's not as good as the Alpha Pokemon battles, but you have to understand, like, it's one third of the story of the game compared to the main path in Legends Arceus. So I'm willing to be a little nice here and say, well, okay, like, they're obviously dedicating time and effort towards other things as well. It's still, it's still good. I liked it. I think it was cool. Titan Pokemon, fight them once, chase them, fight them again. And that's it. Because all of these are new Pokemon, it feels pretty momentous when you find them, but they go down easily. Fortunately, this route may just have the best story of the three, which had us tearing up a little bit at time. There are some Titans that don't go down easily. The I will say that. We've done so in a Pokemon game since Black and White. Starfall Street then is the biggest change from previous Pokemon games, and it utilizes the game's brand new Let's Go mechanic, which is not to be confused with the Let's Go games. With the first three Pokemon in your team, you have to defeat a number of Pokemon within the team's base in 10 minutes by sending your Pokemon out into the overworld to chip away at the opposing team. This will not take you more than a minute and a half. There, if you take 10 minutes on this, then I have some serious questions for you. I, I guarantee you will not take more than two minutes on this. It becomes this. more of a hunt, and if you don't have a type advantage or a decent Pokemon, it can also be a bit of a roll of the dice. The only way you can heal is by using vending machines, and if all three of your Pokemon's health is reduced to zero, you fail and you have to try again. Yeah, but you also get infinite uses of the vending machines. <laughs> You get to take on the base's leader, who charges out in the most audacious Pokemon car you've ever seen. It's that car is so cool! The roots are just different ways of dressing up the series standard, of collecting badges and fighting strong trainers, which- Also, the drip of everyone, especially like the team star bosses, is so good. They all look fantastic. What we've been doing in Pokemon for yonks now. However, we're glad that you're not locked into any one of these routes at any time, and you can pick and choose just when to take on what. You might decide to do all of the gyms first, or vary it up and jump between the objectives, but it never feels checklisty in the way that some open world games do. Instead, you're left to find things by happenstance, even with every location and objective already marked on your map. We def I will think, I, I would think that it's a very cool experience to not look at your map. If you were to just run around in the world and see what you bump into, you'd probably have a really, really good experience because you wouldn't know what kind of gym leader you're going up against. You wouldn't know the difficulty of the Titans. If you're not doing a Nuzlocke or any kind of challenge mode run, you're just playing like a normal playthrough, I would actually advise just don't look at the map. Just run around. Just see what you come across. Just, just have an explore. It's a really cool region to explore. It's massive. So give it a go. Do that. Don't, don't look at the we map. Had a good idea of where we wanted to go, but we wandered off the beaten path way too many times. And that's the biggest joy of Scarlet and Violet. Paldea is your personal Pokemon playground. It's a huge canvas where you can do whatever you want and go wherever you want. It's not segmented into separate zones like in Arceus, and only one area is gated by story, so you can really just go anywhere once you have the ability to get there. To get these abilities, you'll need to upgrade your trusty companion bike, Pokemon Coridon or Moridon, which will happen naturally as you progress through the game. Otherwise, the world is 
is in the palm of your hand, and there are secrets such as hidden items, rarer Pokemon, and much more besides that you will also uncover as your living, breathing Pokemon bike gets better. We were also swept Lizard up in baby. With gorgeous tunes and rhythms, with Undertale's Toby Fox taking on even more arrangements and melodies after showing his chops in Sword and Shield's fantastic tower battle music. His wait, wait, Toby Fox did more of the music in this game? I need to figure out which themes, because I love a lot of the themes in this, a lot of them are kind of disappointed. I always say that the OST in Pokemon always slaps. There are some let you down moments in this, but if Toby Fox did some, I need to find out what it was. Work is instantly recognizable to fans from funky, jazzy tunes to electric, fast paced melodies. There are also multiple variants of the battle themes and overworld music to fit the location or whether you're riding your mount or not. There are some fairly varied segments of Paldea that you can dive into every nook and cranny of a big, sprawling desert, a mountainous tundra, a lake that looks like it could swallow you up, and even a bamboo thicket. There's plenty to explore then, although that's not to say it's perfect. As much as we loved wandering around the open world, there were no real landmarks or spectacles in the region. We were hoping for something significant, like an oversized tree, a crater, or even a unique rock face or carving. Paldea will likely uh, be- There are actually some areas that are like really cool to go to. I found a few areas. You might like stumble across towns by accident and just have a look and explore around and see what's up with them. So I, I don't know if I disagree. I think I can't disagree with that. Size, but if the bamboo forest is the most memorable location, out of places we're not permitted to discuss, then this Spanish-inspired locale loses a bit of its luster. And here's where we need to address what has been consistently the biggest sticking point of Scarlet and Violet up to its release, performance. Some of the trailers haven't been the smoothest to say the least, and our hands-on preview of the game raised questions as to how Paldea would look and run on Switch when in its final form. Having now played the full game with the day one patch applied, we have to say that Scarlet and Violet can look and feel rough when you're exploring the open world. Legends Arceus had its fair share of issues and an inconsistent frame rate, but there are multiple times when the blurry visuals and low FPS threaten to rip us out of the experience here. It's especially distracting when you're riding Coridon or Moridon, speeding off into the distance as the visuals struggle to run at a consistent frame rate, and the scope and beauty of Paldea is lost in a mess of foggy visuals, both docked and undocked. The frame rate of Pokemon and other moving elements in the world reduces the further you move away from them, a common technique used to improve overall refresh rate, but much more noticeable here. If yeah, I will say, during game development, moving away from things and reducing the quality as you move away, that's normal. However, Scarlet and Violet does it when you're about this far away. If I was this far away from you in Scarlet and Violet, I would be a blurry mess right now. <laughs> Given the relative simplicity of the environment compared to the smaller, bustling worlds in stuff like Kirby and the Forgotten Land. When you're inside buildings and in battles, the game can look pretty good. You can see streaks of hair in characters, the stitches and threads in their clothes, and even the shiny slipperiness of Wiglet and the texture of a Mareep's wool. In battles, characters and Pokemon look relatively clean and crisp for the most part. That's what makes it so jarring. When you're up close with something, things look good. Things look really good. If you if there's a Pokemon with fur, you can like see the individual like hairs. You can see like scales on Pokemon. Like everything looks good really up close. But as soon as you step this far away, it is, it is clay in your eyeballs. And they all burst with personality through their stances and interactions, although many battle animations are still incredibly stiff and just feel like an afterthought. Pokemon models sometimes disappear in thin air or appear and drop from above you as well. There are times that Scarlet and Violet almost look like a real step forward visually for Pokemon, but then it loses itself in a mire of pixelated textures and technical issues, especially if it's raining or snowing. Game Freak isn't recently famous for its performance prowess, and whilst the frame rate and other issues will certainly irritate some players, for us the developer gets away with it just thanks to things it does get right with the open world approach and myriad other details. The game- It seems like most people think that the game is really, really, really good, except it looks and performs really, really, really bad, which is what brings the it down. Performance did nothing to diminish the excitement of discovering all the new Pokemon that Scarlet and Violet has to offer. As in Legends Arceus, wild Pokemon appear in the overworld, so you can spot them as they huddle in a grassy field or dip into one of the ponds. Flying Pokemon swoop down from the sky with some bugs dangling from the trees, other monsters will even chase after you. Just the act of filling up your Pokedex, which looks like a rack of elaborate Pokemon magazine. The Pokedex is so cool in this game. They all look like books. They all like slide in like books and you'll have all these really nice pictures of them uh, and, and all the Pokemon. It's, it's there's such a good Pokedex in this game. So good. Photos of each pocket monster is a delight. And the thrill of having a tiny little Fido or monstrous Faradarif approach you with murderous or cuddly intent still doesn't feel old after Legends Arceus earlier this year. Otherwise, battling and catching is no different compared to previous mainline games. Fight your Pokemon in turn-based battles, catch them if you want, etc. In addition, trainer battles are now optional, which works because we usually didn't want to be distracted from just riding around in the wild. You're able to initiate Optional trainer battles. Uh, it's so much better. Yes, thank you. I hate being forced to stop what I'm doing. I hate 
every single time with these trainers, these mandatory trainers that stop your progression and stop where you want to go. The optional trainers, so much of an improvement, so much better. I don't want them to ever go back to force trainer encounters or anything like that. Just allow me to talk to people. It's so easy to tell who a trainer is because they'll have like yellow around the speech box. So if you go and talk to them, you're like, oh, it's battle time. So much more better. That's like a big trainers, improvement. But they're not going to stop you in your tracks. We're lamenting the loss of the ability to catch Pokemon by simply throwing Pokeballs at them, but we love the addition of something we touched on earlier. Let's go. By tapping the R button, you can direct- Losing the ability to just throw a Pokeball and catch something, that sucks so much. It makes the game so much slower. I really wish that they kept that. Just being able to walk up to something, throw a ball, I, I, I miss that so much. Legends Arceus, we had it good. We didn't realize how good we had it until it was taken away from us. You don't really know what you got till it's gone. You know what I mean? The front of your team to attack wild Pokemon for a short period of time. It's much snappier than entering a battle and is excellent for when you specifically don't want to catch them all over and over and over. You can start to feel a bit of a monster for knocking out all these wild creatures minding their own business or feel guilty as your Pokemon's health drops low and they start to feel tired, complete with a pitiful noise that pierces your heart. You can also just send them off to pick up a <laughs> yeah, item when nasty. you're feeling particularly lazy and you just want to cruise along on your slick poker bike. It's a fabulous mechanic for building up materials to create TMs, more on that in a moment, or leveling weaker Pokemon quickly whilst you soak in the world even more. And there's still so much more to talk about. Paldea's unique mechanic to rasterization may have had us raising our eyebrows before release, and visually it might lack the grandeur of Dynamax Pokemon, but it adds much more strategy to combat than we were initially expecting for some- Good news! You forget how dumb Terrastalizing looks because they make it sparkly and shiny, which you're like, ooh, sparkles and shines, how nice. And you're like, you, you disregard the fact that it's a Pokemon is wearing a chandelier on its head. It just pops a pretty hat on. Terrastalizing in battle causes the Pokemon to become that Terra type, so a Pikachu with a water Terra type will go from being electric to being, you guessed it, water. This also means that if that Pokemon uses a move that matches its Terra type, it'll be even more powerful. Used in the right situations and with the right Terra types, this can be devilish, and we were shocked by just how much we enjoyed being battered in raids by those moves. Speaking of moves, we were initially worried about the TM machine, yes that's a technical machine machine, a new crafting mechanic in the game, and returning to the idea of one use only TMs. However, the abundance of materials and the fact that you can find TMs just laying around the world meant that they never really felt like an issue. Gotta admit that- nah, I, I disagree. I think that not having unlimited uses on TMs is just annoying. It's just creating an no, issue, like I mentioned before. That you won't know what materials you need to create your TM until you own them. These machines are at every Pokemon Center in Paldea as well, which are abundant. Basically, it's rarely something you ever need to grind for unless you have no idea what you're after, but then it's back to the magic of digging around Paldea. TMs aren't the only thing you can make though, and Pokemon's culinary step forward from Galar's curries is sandwiches. You can set a picnic up out in the overworld, interact with your Pokemon. I love how every single Pokemon game now has some kind of food gimmick. It's so silly, but I love it so much because I'm a big foodie. I like some Sammies. And I'm, I actually can't wait to try the picnic feature. I want to try it out. Play ball, make tasty bocadillos. I probably butchered that pronunciation as well. In a cute, if awkward, little mini game, you can follow said recipes or try and make some unique flavors. Is that peanut butter? Egg. Depending on the ingredients you use to construct your succulent sub, you'll get different benefits, such as boosting experience for one type of Pokemon or increasing the drop rate of items from a particular type and even Terra Raid boosts. There are tons of these to experiment with, so even our wonkiest sandwich felt like it helped us fill our bags and our Pokemon up even just a little bit. One part of the game we weren't able to test prior to launch was multiplayer, although we were able to sample it briefly during our initial preview. You can invite friends to join you in your travels, although how much mileage you get from it will be down to how you choose to use it. Beyond the traditional trading and battling of years past, you're not given a whole lot of guidance. Having said that, if you just want someone to join you for a ride along, the game doesn't place any major restrictions on you. It's safe to say that there is a lot to take in with Paldea. Corp is gonna be fun then, that's cool. And in conclusion, Nintendo Life gave the game 7 out of 10, which is interesting. Wildly inconsistent performance and visuals, Titan fights are a little disappointing, open world lacks standout locales. Lots of good stuff though, tender character moments, the story moments. I actually think that's a big improvement into the game. I definitely do think it is. And now the IGN review. They haven't finished the review because they wanted to review the multiplayer as well. But essentially what they said was it's, it's a Pokemon game. <laughs> and about the performance, IGN said, I desperately hope some early patches can clean this mess up and bring it, I can't believe I'm saying this, more in line with Arceus or Sword and Shield. But those games have had their technical issues, but they were much more forgivable by comparison because Scarlet and Violet are a blast to play. And aside from a few quibbles about the precise way that certain systems work, Game Freak largely seems to have figured out what kind of open world design works for the series. It truly delivers on the Pokemon fantasy while embracing a more modern RPG style. Even if I cringe while watching NPCs weirdly skate down giant staircases and vanish halfway. <laughs> So IGN have not finished their review, but it's a good game, but my God, they need a patch. Please patch this game. 
Pass this game, Game Freak. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. You can do it. All, all you have to do is sit down. Sit down. Do a little uh, performance increase. Uh, do a little patching. And, and get, get that out there. Boom. Get it done. But I think the most important thing that we need to take a look at is what do the Spanish think? This is a game based off of Spain, Portugal, all of that. So obviously a perspective from people who live in those areas is important because when Galar came out, I was combing over it, my fine tooth comb and my magnifying glass, just, just looking for any kind of uh, inconsistencies or wrongness. But they did a really good job with Galar. So what did the Spanish think of this game? I found this, which I think is actually an incredibly nice message from one of the Spanish reviewers who rated the game very highly. And they said, Scarlet Violet is exactly how you adapt years of tradition to a current design formula. The game is listening proof that every each and every change is a perfect chance to take a step forward. And in that specific sense, the risks that Nintendo undertook have certainly paid off. Paldea is not about representing our culture, but those of us who live within it. I can only be proud to belong to a place that is seen with so much beauty from the outside. Long live Pokemon, long live Game Freak, and long live all of those who have made, uh, that have made th th this beauty of a game. Wow, what that is a pretty incredible comment to say. They think that the representation of Spanish culture and Spain in the game is so good that they themselves are proud to be a part of a culture that is seen with such beauty by the outside. That is good. They gave the game a nine out of 10. Really, really fantastic. Uh, in fact, they all said that uh, technically the game is weak <laughs> and that the plot of the game misses the potential. But still, that's uh, that's a very good uh, perspective from the Spanish right there. At least one Spanish reviewer that looks like the game's pretty good. So uh, go, go get it and subscribe to the second channel.